did anybody actually do anything Sammy said last week? Like, he circled all this stuff, and he underlined all this stuff. Did any of you guys circle or underline anything in your Bible? Do you, can you prove it to me? Can someone prove to me? Does someone have something underlined from last week or circled from last week that they can actually, you do? Do you really? Let me see it. Let me see. Bring it up here. Bring it up here. For real. Do you have something circled or underlined? What did you, what did you circle or underline? What did you circle? What did you underline? First Corinthians 10. Okay, see, good, 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 good. This is good, this is good, this is good. First Corinthians, uh, where? Oh, you did. You really did. Good job. Hey, hey, there you go. Congratulations. So, all right. Now, one more person. One more person. Uh, did you? Oh, let me see it. Let me see. What you got? What you get? What you circle? What you underline? A bunch. There we go. There we go. Let me see. Oh, my gosh. You really did, man. Congratulations. Soma bucks. Soma bucks for you. Okay. Now, this makes me sad. Because earlier this week I said, Sammy, people are loving what you're doing on your iPad and how you're diagramming the scriptures. And I'm preaching next week. Can I use your iPad? No. 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 He's like, I don't share my toys. And I said, well, I, okay, so one of the things is like, in my Strengths Finder, you remember back in the day when people did Strengths Finder? Like, one of my top five is competition. And I don't like to have to follow somebody do something amazing and me not have a chance to, like, equal it or better it. And so I said, well, if I can't circle something on the screen, I at least want everybody in here to have the opportunity to circle, to underline, and highlight. So here's what we're going to do. If you do not have a Bible with you today, either on your phone, a tablet, or live, in-person, physical Bible, I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to give you a Bible and a pen for today. So if you do not have a Bible with you, it's very important that everybody in here has a Bible that they can look at. Phone counts, tablet counts. If you need one in person, just go ahead and raise your hand right now, and we are going to make sure everybody in here has a Bible of some kind, because... What we're going to do today is definitely going to need a Bible. Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, got the one over here. Okay, yeah, go ahead and raise your hand. And while they're passing out those Bibles, we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, um, has anybody ever been to Jamaica before? Has anybody been to Jamaica? Okay, so last year was my 20th anniversary, and uh, my wife and I's 20th anniversary. We had never been, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you can clap for that. Uh, we had never been to Jamaica, uh, ever. And we're like, you know what? This sounds like the perfect opportunity. This is the perfect trip to take, whatever. And we went and we booked this vacation package, and it had the words, all-inclusive. Now, we'd also never been on an all-inclusive vacation. And guys, when they say all-inclusive, they mean it. Like, you wake up, and you go get breakfast, and it's included. It's free. And you're like, oh, this was great. And then you're like, you know what? I think it's time to go to the little coffee shop they have there. And you go to the coffee shop, and the coffee is free. And then you go down to the beach, and there's this little cabana that's, you know, shaded. And you, 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 it's free. You don't have to rent it or anything. It's just free. And then you're like, oh. You know, we're going to just take a nap here and then swim, nap, swim, nap, swim, nap. And then you're like, you know what? It's time for a late lunch. And you go, and the lunch is free. It's all inclusive. It's included. Then you're like, you know what? They have an ice cream shop. It's time for some afternoon ice cream. And you go and get the ice cream. And it is all inclusive. It's free. It's included. And then you're like, wow, this is really nice. And then you're like, you know what? Uh, there's, if, if, you, if you so choose, there's adult beverages. And those adult beverages, all included, all inclusive, it's free. And then you're like, you know what? It's time for another nap. And now it's time for dinner. And the dinner is once again free. And then there's this concert out on the, the, the main deck. And the concert is free. And it's like, this is awesome. All inclusive really means all inclusive. Like, Everything is included. Everything is free. Now, the truth is none of it's free. Like, we paid for it a few months of advance. You know, it's like, no, it, it was definitely not free. But you're like, man, this feels like it was free. 
This feels like, hey, all of this stuff is included. That's included, that's included, that's included. The weather was included. You know, this was really nice. It was all inclusive. All right, let's take a look at this quote by Dallas Willard. The aim of God, <laughs> a Willard fan, my man. The aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with God himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. Guys, what we're talking about today is the fact that every single one of you are included in God's love. The entire point of the Bible the entire story the Bible is telling is that God is building a family that everybody is invited into, that everybody gets to be a part of. When we say all-inclusive, we mean all-inclusive. There's no one who's not invited. And just like the trip that I took had to be paid by a price, God himself has paid the price for you to be in his family. So you are included. Whatever doubt you have, whatever thought you had about, do I belong? Am I welcome? You are welcome here. You are seen, you are known, and you are included. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you today how the entire Bible is telling one story about how you belong here. And so if you have a Bible... I want you to open it to the table of contents. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not joking. Like, like Sammy said something last week that made me sad. He said, it's normal when people encounter parts of the Bible that they don't understand, and that's okay. And that's true. But my goal for you today is to walk out, you guys to all walk away, and you're going to be able to say, I basically understand the whole Bible. I'm not joking. That's what we're going to do. So you, you're going to be able to one-up everybody at your Super Bowl parties later today, like when there's a really boring commercial or if, like, one of the teams starts really blowing out the other. You can just drop this bit of knowledge, but I can explain the whole Bible. You want to hear it? So let's begin. <clears throat> On the table of contents, hopefully if it's listed in order, uh, it starts with the Old Testament, and the first book you see is Genesis. All right. Genesis is the story of God creating his family. If you're, if you're a note taker, you want to know something, that Genesis is a story of God creating his family. Starts on page one. And we're going to just hit some key verses as we go along to kind of show you that I'm not just making this stuff up, that you can trust this. And so in Genesis chapter one, starting at verse 26, don't worry about, because we're going to be jumping around, they will be up on the screen. Uh, if you just had someone hand you a Bible, this is on page two. You can just write that down. Uh, let's see. Starting at verse 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and all over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. The first thing that God commands people is he's like, hey, I'm going to bless you and I want you to expand the family. Like, I love you. I have created you to share in my love. I have created you to be a part of what it is we are doing. And here's the deal. I want more people involved. Be fruitful and multiply. Let's keep spreading this thing. Let's keep seeing this, how this goes. Now, if you guys have been in church in any amount of time, you know that uh, Genesis chapter 1, everything's awesome. And Genesis chapter 3, uh, it all goes to hell, like quite literally. And so um, it goes bad. But God doesn't give up. And as you start to read through more of Genesis, you see like, okay, people do dumb things. People do bad things. God keeps providing a way. And then you get to this wild story in Genesis chapter 11, called the Tower of Babel. And for like the longest time, I was always like, as a kid growing up in church, I was like, that seems like a, just a, a randomly weird story that was just thrown in for no reason other than like, well, here's how different languages came to be or something like that. But Genesis chapter 11 shows something that I'm like, oh, this starts to get repeated throughout the whole Bible. And this is what it says starting at uh, verse four. It says, then they're talking about the people of the earth. And it, then it says, then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. 
And it's like, random, like you, I mean, at first you think they're really dumb, like you're really gonna build a tower all the way to heaven, like they don't know enough about like oxygen deprivation at certain heights, and you're like, yeah, that's not gonna really work, but I'm like, why did they put this story in the Bible? And then I realized, it's the actual counter to what God told them in Genesis, in the, in the Garden of Eden. God said, I want you to share my love, I want you to go and spread it across the world, and in the Tower of Babel, they're like, let's get rid of God and stay here and keep it keep all the blessing for ourselves. Like we see good things happening, we don't want to share them. We don't want to see it grow. We don't want to see it expand to anybody else. Let's just stay here, build a tower, get rid of God and do our own thing. And it's like, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is the exact opposite of God expanding the family. And so of course God's like, yeah, uh uh-uh. so we're going to we're going to switch that around. That's Genesis chapter 11, okay? Genesis chapter 12. God starts over. He's like, no, no, we are sticking to this plan. We are sticking to this plan. And in Genesis chapter 12, starting there, right at verse one, the Lord said to a man named Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. But catch it, that's not it. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So God is saying once again, my plan is a family where everybody gets to be invited in. Everybody gets to be included. And if the people are gonna go one way, I'll just start over here and we'll start. And so with Abraham, like we're gonna start over. We're not giving up on this. People are too valuable. People matter too much. And then he tells Abram, I'm going to bless you, but don't forget this. Don't forget this. You are blessed to be a blessing. He says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. And then you will be a blessing. And what, once again, you're going to have to do what I'm doing for you. You're going to have to share what I'm giving you because people need to be a part of this. He says, I will make you a great nation. Don't think in terms of like Canada, US, Mexico. Like when the, when, in the Old Testament, when they said nation, they meant people, a people group. They meant like all of the relatives, all the people. Like it's not a political boundary as much as it is a group of people who like that share the same commonalities. And he's saying, I'm going to make people connected through you. They're going to know that there's a God that loves them. There's going to know, they're going to know that there's a God who cares for them. And this is, once again, the story of the Bible. Let's keep going, though. That was Genesis. Exodus, if you're looking at your uh, table of contents. God rescues his family. That's the story of Exodus. God rescues his family. They get uh, enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. God comes in, and he rescues them. Uh, let's talk about Leviticus and Numbers. That's the story of how God teaches them to live as a family and trust him. Deuteronomy. This is a really interesting book of the Bible. In Deuteronomy, basically Moses gives this great speech and sermon before he heads off into uh, where he dies and then they go off. And he tells them a couple things. And you're going to see this repeated throughout scripture. Remember who you are. Don't exchange God's love. Don't try to contain God's love. He tells them over and over and over again, remember who you are. God, you, you are God's family. He has rescued you. He has looked after you. He's led you. He's guided you. Now, when you go into this new land that you're about to go into, do not exchange my love for something else. There's going to be a thousand temptations all around you to do something else. Do not exchange my love. Secondly, do not try to contain my love. Do not just keep it for yourself. You're going to encounter orphans, widows, foreigners, those in need, and it is your job to make sure that they are as fully included as you are. Our family does not stop. That's Deuteronomy. Let's keep going. Joshua. That's the story of how God families moves in and fights with the neighbors. Uh, Quite literally. They had crazy neighbors. Like, the neighbors were awful. They did horrible things. Like, you sometimes are like, why is it so bloody in Joshua? And you're like, they're living next to people who do children's sacrifices. Like, this is not good. And so that's the story of Joshua. The book of Judges. Do you remember Deuteronomy? Remember who you are? Well, Judges. Uh, the people forgot about God and the family collapses. 
someone once, oh, I heard someone once talk about, they said the book of Judges is like if Tarantino wrote a book of the Bible. Like it is just crazy messed up. If you ever read it, like you're always like, is this supposed to be in here? Like this seems very, 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 very R-rated. And yeah, it is messed up because what happens when the people forget about God? Things go really, really bad. The next book of the Bible, Ruth. God expands who can be in the family. It's a story of God bringing someone in who's like, hey, they don't have a place. They don't have a people. Guess what? They do with me. They get to be included into the family. The next set of books, we're going to go from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. If you're taking notes, you can just circle that, that whole list because they all belong together. And in here, it says simply this. God's family exchanges God for a king and keeps the blessing for themselves. It does not go well. That's, that's the story. Um, the verse I want to kind of draw your attention to in this one is 1 Samuel 8, 7. 1 Samuel verse 8, 7. If you're writing notes on one of these new Bibles that you just got, this is on page 148. This is what it says. This is God talking to Samuel. It says, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, we see the history of Israel and what happens when people trade away God for something else. There were, depending on how you do the counting, there was roughly 40 to 42 kings of Israel. Eight of them were good. Eight out of 40. 80% of the kings were absolutely horrible and bad and did like awful things to the people. They did awful things because the people forgot that what they needed was God. They took a look at all the nations around them and they're like, man, these other nations, they have a king. Like, how come we don't have one? And God said, I'll give you what you want, but you need to know what you're asking for. And people are like, yeah, we're cool with that. We, yeah, once again, they took the blessing, they took the relationship they had with God and they exchanged it for something else. And so from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, we see the story over and over again. Like I said, there were eight good ones. So there were, you know, there were some bright spots along the way, but for the most part, it went really bad. And it ended up with the nation being destroyed and the people scattered across the region. But God doesn't give up. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, the next set of books, you can just circle those because those two to go together. It's the story of God rebuilding a family from the ashes. Once again, they had rejected him. They'd walked away, but God says, I'm not giving up on this. It matters too much. People matter too much. They belong in the family. And so God rebuilds a family from the ashes. He pulls together a remnant of the people and they start over. The next book that you're going to see is the book of Esther. And in Esther, we see the story of even when God seems absent, he provides for and protects his family. Esther's one of just the coolest books in the Bible. If you ever have a chance, you should read it, maybe this afternoon, especially if the game gets boring. Uh, let's see. The next set of books of the Bible, the next set that you're going to see, we're going to go from Job through Song of Solomon. You can just circle all of those together. And basically, the story that God is telling in those is that God's love transcends. It transcends our suffering, it transcends our circumstances, it transcends our wisdom. It goes beyond our experiences, beyond our understanding, beyond our knowledge. It goes beyond our understanding of love. And in all of those books there, God is just telling once again, I'm better than you could ever possibly imagine. I'm better than what you're trading me away for. You think that like suffering is the end of the story and I am there in the suffering. You think that you like the confusion of this world is all that there is. No, I'm beyond the confusion. I am there with you, and I will be there with you through it. Someone once said that if you, um, if you bury yourself in the Psalms, you'll, you'll come up understanding God, and that's true because in these books, God shows us so clearly how his love is a triumph over everything we face, brokenheartedness, uncertainty, bad futures, bad circumstances, the loss of loved ones. God is there in it all and keeps going through it all. And he keeps saying, you are part of my family. Then we get to the really big section of the Bible that most of us have never read. And it goes from Isaiah to Malachi. Isaiah to Malachi. 
circle all of those. And if this sounds familiar, it kind of is. Basically, the theme is, remember who you are. Don't exchange my love. Don't contain my love. It's God telling the people the same thing that he told them in Deuteronomy. He's telling them once again. And the, the interesting thing is that Isaiah through Malachi take place during that uh, Samuel through Chronicles period. So Samuel through the Chronicles is like the official account of what happened. And then Isaiah through Malachi are all the prophets that came along and they're like, yeah, what's officially happening sucks and we need to do something about it. And so they kept coming back over and over again into the people and saying, hey, look, remember who you are. Remember who we were called to be. We were called to be a blessing. We've, we've abandoned God's blessing and now we're just doing our own thing and it's going horrible. Remember who you are. Stop trading out God for trinkets. Stop trading away God for other things. And stop ignoring the needs that you see all around you in your community. If there was a verse that I could pull your attention, and man, this was so hard. I had like 18 that I'm like, I, I can't give them 18. I got to give them one. And so Isaiah chapter one, starting at verse 17. If you wanted to sum up this section, this is, the, uh, this is what Isaiah was telling the people from God. It says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Once again, be a blessing to those around you. And then verse 18, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Once again, God says, I know you've messed up. I know you've done a lot of dumb things. I know you've abandoned me and gone your own way. But you still can belong. You still can have a place. Come, let's settle the matter. He says, like, come on, let's, let's figure this out. Let's get back together. I still want you in my family. And all those people that you're ignoring, stop ignoring them. They get invited in too. And that takes us through the whole Old Testament. Now, let's take a look at what we got next. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Circle those. Those all go together. That's the story of Jesus coming and rebuilding and renewing humanity into a family. Once again, the people had been scattered all over the region. They were without a king. They were without any type of national identity. They were... They were hungering for someone to come and put them back together. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I'm going to do that. That's what we're going to be about. Once again, God's mission does not stop. It keeps going. He keeps finding a way to include people. And the whole story of Jesus is him like proving over and over again, look, I am the person that you've been waiting for. I am the person who's going to show you once again what it looks like to be human. We're going to rebuild this thing that's been broken. We're going to renew it. We're going to show you exactly what it looks like. Once again, I was like, what, what scripture do I give from here when there's like a million good ones? This might sound familiar. We read it earlier today. But in John chapter 10, starting at verse 10, this is Jesus talking to the people. And he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Let's pause right there. Everybody that would have been listening to Jesus at that moment would have known what he was talking about. They'd had nothing but bad rulers. They were under Roman occupation. Like the only leaders they had were bad leaders. And so he stops and says, look, you know how bad things are. I don't have to tell you that. But I have come so that you might have life and have it to the full. It is possible, even in the midst of this chaos, even in the midst of this brokenness, you can be a part of this. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. Now, these, these farmers and stuff would have known exactly what he's talking about. These, these shepherds, herdsmen, yeah, like sometimes you hire a guy and when the going gets tough, he abandons it. I mean, some of you guys are business owners, you know that, you're like, can you show up three days in a row? Like, please, you know? Uh, and so what does the hired man do? When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The, then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. 
The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. Some of you, this is your experience. You're like, I wish I didn't have everyone in my life just run out on me. But what does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus doesn't just know us as sheep. He knows us individually. It said, I think in verse three, which we didn't read, he says, I know them by name. Like you're not just invited in to um, an orphanage. You're invited into a family where your name is known, your, your, your personality is known, and it's valued, and it's welcome. And this is what Jesus is saying, like, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They know me. And how, 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 do, I, how do you know you can trust me? I'm willing, and I will die for you. And then in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My no, oh, that's what I just read. Uh, verse 16, the Oh, catch this, catch this. Look at verse 16. This is crazy. This is crazy. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. He's telling them, like, guys, we're a family, but guess what? The family's not complete yet. There's more people that need to be in here. There's more people that need to be a part of this. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is saying the mission doesn't stop. The mission to build the family keeps going. It's going to keep continuing. We're not giving up on this. We're going to keep doing it. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the story of Jesus doing exactly that. He says, this is the way to be human. This is the way to love others. This is the way, like, look how I'm doing it, and then follow me. And if you don't think that I'm in it for the long haul, I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise again. And that's exactly what happens in the Gospels. He says, you can trust me. I've removed every barrier between you and God. So let's go build this family. Then we come to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is maybe my favorite book in the Bible. Uh, it changes based on whatever book I'm reading. But I love Acts. It's, and this is basically it. The Holy Spirit is on the move expanding the family. That is the book of Acts. Like Jesus said, hey, more people need to be in this family. And the book of Acts is like, Okay, Holy Spirit, boom, we're going. We're going north, we're going south, we're going east, we're going west. Like you read through the book of Acts, it's like, and then they were there, 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 and these people got saved, and these people got saved, and these people got saved. Oh, and then they started to run out of food, so that they collected money for the poor, and then the widows weren't being, uh, being overlooked, so they started a new program so that the widows were being taken care of. And as you go through the book of Acts, you start to see, it starts to go to all kinds of people. Like before it had primarily been a Jewish audience and then everybody starts getting involved from all these different lands and all these different nations. And then right in the middle of the book of Acts, they have a big church meeting because all of a sudden it's like, er, stop, Acts 15. They're like, well, wait a second. Can we really let non-Jewish people participate in this? Like, I see that they like this. And I see that they like Jesus, and I see that they're kind of doing this stuff. But in Acts 15, they have to stop and say, can new people who aren't Jewish become part of the family? Will we contain God's love to just us? And so in Acts 15, and this might be one of the most pivotal things ever, because frankly, none of us grew up Jewish, or maybe a few of us did. But the fact that we're here today means that in Acts 15, they had this big meeting, and like, well, are, is it just going to stay with us? Are we just going to contain it? And the, the decision that they reached was, you know, I don't think we can. Don't think that's a good, like, it wasn't like a resounding, of course not. I mean, it was more of like, I think we should do this. I think we should let people in. I think we should let, you know, we should make more room for everybody else. And they wrote a couple letters to some of these new believers, and they're like, hey, look, here's a few things that, that just creep us out. Please don't do them. But if you can do that, then, yeah, sure, you can be a part of it. And the family expands. The family continues to grow. The next thing, the next group, you can circle Romans through 3 John. Romans through 3 John. Those all go together. Those are letters of basically... How to live as God's family. Once again, don't contain his love, don't exchange his love. That's the repeated message over and over again. It goes over and over. Hey, you see what everybody else around you is doing that leads to death? Don't do that. Don't exchange God's love. Hey, you see all these other people that you don't like because they speak different, think different, look a little bit different, eat a little bit different? Yeah, don't, don't exclude them. 
don't contain my love. It's for them as well. And it's just letter after letter after letter to different individuals, different churches saying, once again, here's how it looks. God loved you, right? Yes, God loved me. Okay. He wants you to love the people around you. Oh, that's tough. Yes, it is tough. They do look different. They smell different. They eat different. So do you. Keep inviting them in. And then we get to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And in Revelation, we see that God brings heaven to earth and the family is reunited forever. That's the story of Revelation. God brings heaven to earth and the family is reunited forever. Uh, on, if, you're, if, you want a, if you want a text to kind of like anchor that, Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 2. If you're, in, uh, if you're in the new Bible that you just got, it's page 667. And it says, yeah, it's kind of funny for those that get it. <laughs> it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. God is reunited with his people. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's the end of the story. That's where we're headed. And everybody gets to be included. I make fun of Alex because he can't get through a, a worship service without crying and singing. And then he turned around and said to me, you can't preach a sermon without crying, so I don't know what you're making fun of me for. But guys, that's the story of the Bible. That is the complete story. God is building a family. You are all included you are all invited in, and he's not giving up. He's going to keep coming for you. He's going to keep asking you to be a part of it. So now you, you can now explain the Bible to anybody. It's that, that's the story. Every, I mean, there's lots of books, there's lots of chapters, but it's one story about God pursuing you with everything that he is. And no matter what you've done, or no matter how badly you think you've messed it up, or no matter how far you've turned away, you are included. That's the story of the Bible. Now let's talk about us because so far this has been super high level theoretical and it would be very easy to be like, yeah, that was good. Let's walk away. Let's talk about Soma. We're starting this series called Church today and we face the exact same temptations that everybody in scripture faced. The first temptation that we face is to exchange God's love. Now, Sammy did an awesome job talking about this last week. So if you want to go deep dive into this one, just go listen to the sermon from last week. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. I will say this, though. This is an election year. And the big temptation for so many church folks is to forget that God is on the throne and to start freaking out, thinking that if your guy or your woman doesn't get elected, then everything is over and there's no coming back. And, and here's the deal. Vote for whoever you're going to vote for. You know, n nothing wrong with that. But I see so many church folk start treating each other or treating people they disagree with as subhuman. Like, I'm like, would, would God want you talking to his son or daughter that way? And one of our big temptations, and like I said, I'm only going to touch on this briefly because I don't want to belabor it. But like, remember, guys, this is an election year. Every person you see, whether you agree with them or not, is a son or daughter of God and should be treated as such. So you can disagree with somebody, you can vote differently than somebody, that's all fine. But remember, God is still in control. Our love for each other will speak far louder than whatever vote we cast. Keep that in mind, we'll be good. So let's talk, like I said, I don't wanna talk about that one too much, Sam already did a great job. Let's talk about the other temptation. This is the one that really worries me. Second temptation is just simply this. It's to contain God's love. It's to contain God's love. And here's what I mean by this. We have always been blessed to be a blessing. It started in Genesis 1 and it goes all the way through scripture. We are blessed to be a blessing. And the big temptation, especially for a church like us, that start, that's growing, that we're seeing new faces and we're seeing new people, 
is to, start to, is to start to let fear speak so much louder than God's love. And fear, like no one ever says, I don't think anybody else in here needs God's love. No love for you. Like no one says that. But what we do is we let fear start to talk and we start to say, well, well, if we keep growing, will anyone still notice me? That's a, I get it. That's a, that speaks loud. Or if we keep growing, like, will, will my kids just get lost in the shuffle? I don't know if this is a good thing. Or if we keep growing, will, will I still be needed? Like, there's somebody better now than me at that job, and maybe I'll just get left behind, or maybe I'll just get replaced, or maybe I'll just get forgotten about. And those are very real, valid fears. But what we have to remember is that God's love is made more complete when it's shared. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The more we share God's love, the better it gets. See, one of the things that we're forgetting is that we're forgetting as we share his love, we become more alive. As more people get to experience it, we're gonna, be, we're gonna have new opportunities to do new things that we had not been able to engage in before. God's love gets better as it's expanded. This is, this is why he set it up the way that he did. God's like, God is the perfect God. He doesn't set stuff up that's supposed to fail. I think we just sang about that. Like, as we love each other, things get better. Now, I practiced this three or four times this week so that I did not cry. And I'm, it's a roll of the dice. We'll see what happens. But let me, let me make it super, super personal. I remember when I first came to this church about a year and a half ago. And without going into a lot of details, uh, my mom lives with me. And I asked her if I could share this story. My mom lives with me. Uh, my, if you guys have bad dads, you'll understand all where a lot of this comes from. Um, and I remember how she felt and how she was when she came here. She was very nervous about moving here because she didn't have anybody and she didn't have like, it's easy for me. Like I roll in here, I get put up on stage. Some of you guys will be nice to me. That's just the way it goes. Um, she doesn't have that luxury. And I have seen her come alive in the last year and a half in ways that I was like, yes, absolutely. Because some of you have been great friends to her. And then she's gotten to be a great friend to some of you. And together you have made her life and she has made your life better. So when we talk about there needing to be more people, it's not just a theoretical, it's a real. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my family's life. Some of you have people in your life and you would give anything if someone would be their friend. You would give anything to see them come alive. And it can happen here. It can happen at Soma, not because we're super awesome and special, but because that's what God has been doing throughout all of human history. It's what we're designed for. It's what we were made for. Some of you, you're like, I'm afraid about this place getting bigger. And I just want to tell you, we will do everything to make sure that people are known. But even more so than that, God will too. There are opportunities that we don't even have yet because the right people aren't in the room. Someone asked me, actually, I get asked this about maybe once a month. They're like, why do you guys do Eden and you not do something for men? And, I'm, and here's always my response. We have a dedicated group of leaders that make Eden happen. They're not on staff, they volunteer their time. They are super intentional about making sure Eden is not just for us, but it's for our community. And th their goal is always 50% of the room is people who do not yet know Jesus. The leaders are there, the vision is there, the team is there. We get men that wanna do the same thing, we'll entertain it. I'm not, we're not anti-men, I'm, I'm a guy, I like guys. You know, like we're cool. Like, but that opportunity is not here yet. But the opportunity for Eden is because there is a group of women who's like, we are going to go to bat. Same thing with young adults. This is why we do these things because we believe there are people in our community that desperately need the love of God and they're willing to sacrifice everything for it. And so as we continue to grow as a church, and I know like, especially if you've been here at the 11 a.m. service, when you start to come in, you're like, man, it's like, 
Like the temperature gets hot in the 11 a.m. just from the body heat, okay? And you're like, well, are we getting too big? Or we need to, do we need to figure out some new things? Like maybe we should just stop. And the thing is, we're not going to stop. We're just not. There's this guy named Alan Hirsch, and he has this quote. And he says, it's not so much that the church has a mission. It's that the mission of God has a church. God's not going to stop. And churches can either participate or not participate. Now, here's the deal. God's not gonna gonna stop loving us if we don't participate in his mission. He won't. God loves us no matter what. But what will happen is we'll slowly start to die. If we stop saying it's okay for new people to sit here, if we start trying to contain it, if we say, well, this church is only for these kind of people or those kind of people, or if we start saying like, this is, there's just not space for them, so we should just stop and just take care of ourselves, we will start to die. And so I know that for some of you, things are starting to get uncomfortable. Like you used to know almost everybody here, and then you knew most of the people, and then you knew some of them, and then you roll in on a Sunday and you're like, I know like five people, and that, I get it. That's frightening, it's fearful. Where's my in all of this? But God's not gonna stop. He's not gonna stop including you. He's not gonna stop making room for you. He's not gonna stop making sure that we have a way. When I first moved here, like I said, uh, one, I love to see what happened with my mom, but I got really nervous because my son says, Daddy, I don't like this church. I'm like, oh my gosh. Now he's four. And I was like, buddy, why do you not like this church? And this is when we were over at the mall. And he said, there's no space for me in that room. And I was like, don't you worry, son. We're merging. We're going to a place that's a lot bigger than the little closet in the mall, okay? And so, and he loves it. But it really, he liked that. And it was so funny to hear him say, there's no room for me there. And it was, we had like a whole bunch of kids in a classroom. We might have been violating a fire code or two. I'm not sure. Uh, But his fear is the same fear that a lot of you have. Will they make room for me? Will someone sit with me? Will there be space for me? And guys, we're going to die making that happen. We will go to whatever length we need. We will spend whatever money. We will do whatever it takes. We will arrange things however it needs to be because that's how much people matter to God. And that's how much they matter to us. And so there's a couple invitations. Absolutely, you can clap for that. There are a couple invitations that I just want to extend today. I want to extend one invitation to the people in here who are not part of the family yet. Like, I don't have to tell you about how bad hell is because you've been living it. You've been walking through it. You've been walking it alone. You've been walking it without anyone in your, on your side or in your corner. And my first invitation to you is just simply to say, join the family. Give your life to Jesus. Give your life to God. Make that today. There is no reason to keep doing this life alone, all abandoned without anyone. And so if that's you, once again, we're going to, so sing here in just a second. And if you want someone to come pray with you at the altar or over on one of the walls, we'll have people that are willing to alter the stage. I don't want to call it altar. We'll have someone that's willing to, to pray with you, talk about that. You can text the number that they'll put on the screen in a second. But that's the first invitation. If you're not part of the family, join the, you're not joining an organization. You're joining a family where your name is known, where you are welcome and you belong. The second one is for those of us, my second invitation is for those of us who are still afraid to let go of the fear and to come alive with what God has for you in this season. Like you're afraid, I'm not going to be known. I guarantee you, if you start loving people well, you will be better known than you have ever been known before. The great beauty of God's love is once again, the more that we give it, the more that we become alive. And so if you're afraid, like I don't think anybody knows I'm here. I don't think anybody sees me. Man, get in the game, join us because you will be seen, you will be known, and you will be loved. And finally, my invitation is to some of you that have been coming for a couple weeks or maybe a few months, and you're finding life here. My invitation to you is to share that, because I guarantee you, you know someone who needs the same joy that you're experiencing, the same hope that you're beginning to find. Because guys, the story is too good. God's love is too good. The future is too good for us to contain it for ourselves.